Welcome back to New Scientist TV. This month we'll look at how you can let your body speak for you on the internet. We'll also go to new depths to explore underwater disasters. But first, we're going to see a robot butler being put through its paces. Sandrine Kusterman tells us more. Here in Birmingham, Dora the robot is exploring a home for the first time. Nick Hawes and his team are designing it to help people around the house. But for Dora to do that, it needs to know its environment very well. You want to give the robot some kind of tour. But a robot needs complete information about the world. And you don't want to show it every last corner of your house. You want to do it, have it sort of exploring for itself. So the idea of Dora is you can give it a partial tour, and then it'll expand its knowledge by exploring the world. Off you go then. When Dora discovers a new space, it uses a laser scanner to build up a map. Looking okay. here but it can also recognize objects to work out what kind of room it's in. What we've done is associate each model that it can recognize, which object it can recognize with a kind of description of the category. So Dora has the information that says cereal boxes are often found in kitchens, bags are often found in kitchens, and it can reason from this to determine what kind of room it's in. I infer that room one is a kitchen. For Dora to be efficient, it needs to decide when to explore and when to look for objects. Hawes is programming it to balance these goals. Along with a set of priorities that we can manually configure into the robot, it decides on a ranking across all the goals and then just picks the highest one. So if there's a huge bit of space that it hasn't been to and it's very nearby, it'll probably go there because that gives it the most information with the least amount of effort. By testing Dora in the real world, Hawes hopes to improve the system. He's found it has problems detecting doors. It also doesn't look for objects efficiently. Currently when it searches for objects, it's just looking everywhere where there's an obstacle in its map, it's looking for objects there, which generates quite uninformed search behaviour. So it'll look all across every blank wall when you're watching it thinking, well, you should be looking on the tabletop because I always find objects in the tabletop. Dora is a long way from being perfect, but it does prove that a robot can identify what it doesn't know and fill in these gaps by itself. I see something that appears to be magazine. Long term, we're going to look to build systems with a wider range of these knowledge gaps and a broader array of actions to fill. Next, we'll take a look at how to keep rusting ships from wreaking havoc in the waters. Sean O'Neill takes up the story. This wartime ship sank with a fortune of jewels and gold aboard, but thousands of other wrecks contain something much more troublesome, vast quantities of oil. Here in Scotland, Patrick Crawford works for a company that's diffusing these slicking time bombs. You need to um, you know, assess what kind of state the vessel's in, because ultimately if it's still in relatively good condition, then it's not really a high priority. Whereas if it's getting, you know, if the steel's starting to get thin, you know, you're looking at something that could potentially be a, a, a you know, huge pollutant. This wreck was leaking oil, so the UK's Ministry of Defence conducted a survey. These images were created using sonar. They reveal the exact position of the vessel and the location of the oil. The ship positioning uh, affects the job in a, in a huge way. If the, the vessel's, for example, if the vessel's sitting the right way up, you'll have to cut through multiple decks to get down to where the, the fuel is stored within the vessel. Whereas when the vessel's on its side, you, um, you can get easier access to, to where the, the fuel is located within the vessel. Deep Tech has developed an extraction tool that can be remotely controlled. It uses suction cups to attach itself to the vessel. Then a built-in drill can pierce the tank, and a pump can remove the fuel. Our system is designed to go to full ocean depth. As you get deeper and deeper, there become more problems with the pumping. You need a larger and larger pump to cope with uh, the viscosity of the oil. You know, you're, you're pulling it that way. But generally, for light oils, it, uh, it, it's actually buoyant, so it wants to float up. In this case, oil leaked into the cabins, so a hose was inserted through a porthole to extract it. If a fuel tank splits, further visits may be necessary. But soon there could be another alternative. The other thing which uh, we're looking into is oil-eating bacteria. So after you've sucked all the oil out of the vessel, is then injecting oil-eating bacteria within the vessel, getting every single possible part of it so you can actually really reduce the risk down to next to nothing. Finally, we see how your avatar could soon be moving to your groove. McGregor Campbell takes up the story from California. When we communicate in real life, our body language can convey a lot. 
Here at SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles, a team is showing how we could have the same ability online. Vladlin Koltun and Sergey Levine have created software that can generate movements on the fly. A set of gestures are stored in the system. As you speak, it selects the best ones based on your speech pattern. The, the first thing you might think of to get gestures from speech is to try to actually understand what a person is saying. But it turns out that understanding speech as it's being spoken is difficult. So we couldn't really use the semantic meaning of what was being said. So instead we use uh, things like uh, intonation, intensity, uh, the speed at which you're speaking. To create the system, the team used motion capture. An actor was filmed extensively so they could map his body language to his speech. We detect individual gestures in the motion capture and that becomes our gesture library. And then we also use uh, these, the speech and the gestures that the actor did to learn the relationship between speech and gesture. I decided to try the system for myself. As we use avatars more and more, we'll want them to behave as closely to our real selves as possible. I want to see how realistic these gestures are and if they look anything like my own. So if I start, if I talk in a monotone and, or a very subdued voice, there's not very many gestures that will go with that. But if I get really excited because I'm at SIGGRAPH and I just saw a lot of crazy computer animation, then I will probably have some gestures associated with that. Since the system chooses gestures based on the way you speak, they can easily be applied to different characters. So we can take that style and we can apply it to a human being, to an, to an actor, or even to an octopus who has you know, his own octopus gestures, but they still have that style. My avatar moves in a pretty human way, although it doesn't mimic my actual gestures. But there are plans to improve the software so it can map a person's movements in real time. The next step is working with uh, sensing devices uh, that can sense the, the gesture of, uh, of the communicator in real time, map it onto a virtual character in an appropriate way, and we're hoping that over time, in this way, we can make uh, remote communication in virtual worlds more effective, more expressive, more useful. That's all for now, but there are lots more videos at our website at newscientist.com forward slash video. Or keep in touch with us by following us on Twitter at newscientisttv. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.